Welcome to Charity Therapy, a podcast from Birkin Law about building better nonprofits. I'm your host, Jess Birkin. Hey, 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 and welcome to this episode of Charity Therapy. Guess who's back? My good buddy from Twitter. Hello. T. Clay Buck. There should be like a sound effect, like it goes, wah, wah, T. Clay Buck. Yeah, you do. I really do. Uh, Well, you may remember Clay. He and I are Twitter friends, and Clay is an amazing fundraising consultant who's TCB fundraising. Uh, I've got him back for another round of fundraising (laughs) Q&A, and this time we've got a doozy. Thanks for being here, Clay. Hey, thank you for having me again. I'm so happy to be here. So now, Clay, Uh I need to talk to you about your Twitter profile. Oh, dear. It says you're a recovered actor. Mm. I no, want recovering, recovering in process. In oh, process. Okay. Yeah. We're not yeah. done with it yet. No. Could you tell us though, what's the best role you ever played and why? <laughs> There's a wonderful farce. It's dated now, but called uh, Lend Me a Tenor. Ken Ludwig. Um, very popular in the the late nineties was on Broadway, the whole thing. And I, I got to play the the um the aging, uh, slightly befuddled um, opera star. And it was oh. a lot of fun and it was silly and there was a lot of running around and slamming doors and it was great. I love that. Okay. I like, where's the recording? No. Nope. That's amazing. <laughs> nope. 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 <laughs> Thankfully, this was before social media. So, oh, I'm so glad that my whole childhood was before social media. Oh, amen, friend. <laughs> amen. Oh, well, with that. Let's dig into our one and only doozy of a fundraising question. Are Mm. you ready, sir? I bring it. Yes, let's do it. Okay, here we go. Every year in my organization, we do a staff competition for a peer-to-peer fundraiser. Mm. Staff members win prizes when they meet certain goals, and the winner gets an extra day of PTO. We've had great success with multiple employees raising several thousand dollars each year. But one of our newer staff members approached me, concerned that she knew she couldn't raise very much money. She's from a low-income background, and she didn't feel comfortable asking her family and friends for donations. But she didn't want to seem disengaged in the competition. Looking back, I'm realizing it's the same people every year that bring in the big money, and there are lots of staff who never win anything. I'm starting to question the equity of this competition and whether the impact on our organization's culture is worth it. Do you like fundraising drives like this? Mm. Wow. Uh, there is mm. a lot going on here. So how much time do we have? <laughs> as much as we need. Hey, look, um, let's not get in the business of shaming um, anybody that does anything yes. in fundraising. I just really, I really want to start there, right? Like, I don't want to finger point and go, this is a bad thing to do and you shouldn't be doing this and and blah, blah, blah. Because I'm just, the older I get and the longer I do this, the more I'm convinced that most charities are doing the best they can with the resources they can and making the best decisions that they can and bravo support to all of that. And having said that, please stop. (laughs) Please stop. this. The road Um, to hell is paved with good intentions, Clay. uh, Absolutely. You know, the question that's posed is, do you like fundraising drives like this? No, no, I do not. Okay, so I've answered the question. Let's now let's let's pick it apart a little bit, though. Yeah, and let's let's talk about why. For, from my perspective, I love that this person really asks the question. Forgive me if I get it wrong, uh, but I'm starting to question the equity of this competition. That's what and they I said. Think that is the. I think that is the key. Bravo for looking back at it and realizing that it's just a few staff that participate. Um, because I guarantee you. I guarantee you there are staff every year that dread this, that don't look forward to this. Bravo to the one person who came forward. Her socioeconomic static has, has nothing to do with anything here, right? Because you, you've got people uh, who dread this and don't like it, who come from high wealth, right? Yeah. And you've likely got a core group of, of people who think it's a lot of fun and do it and jump into it. And I guarantee you they're the same ones that jump into everything that you do. 
I am willing to bet that this causes a lot of inequity and a lot of misbalance in the organization. I am willing to bet that there are a number of pl- employees who don't participate at all because they feel the same way. Yeah. And I bet there are those who participate and feel like it's a forced march Correct. and that they have to. And I wouldn't be surprised if this uh, brave person who stepped forward feels like their job might be at stake if Correct. they don't engage, right? That is the problem with all employee giving programs is no matter how good you are, no matter how strong your culture is, it is always going to come across as coercion. Like this is a condition of my employment. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And I say that as a person that has worked inside nonprofits, mm-hmm. like that is Same. that is how it feels. I Absolutely. say this as a person who has run employee giving programs, right? Now, that said, I actually believe very strongly in employee giving programs, and I believe everybody should have them. And I think they should be a part of onboarding. I think they should be a private issue between the employee and HR. And I think it should be offered and made available, but by no means coerced and by no means doing everything absolutely possible to make it clear that this is voluntary. It's something you choose to do if you wish to do. And if you're going to do it, make it available as a payroll deduction pre-tax so that the employee can make it a part of, right? And then it's going to be on the development office to treat those employees like donors. Yeah. Right. Well, and my beef with this is a lot of times we're not paying fair market wages. We're not paying fair market salary. Correct. And then we're like, oh, BTW, please give me 10% of your pittance that we're paying you Correct. to work here. Correct. What? You know? Correct. Now, now chances are that most people are working at your charity because they really believe in the mission and they love it and they're willing to work. Well, of course. Lower wages and long hours and all of that, which is a whole level of inequity that we still need to address and will always need to address in the sector. And then you add on to it, hey, we want you to give to, like, no, enough, right? Right. Um, As if the only people that work there are people who are well off that can afford to work for charity and basically give away their salary, too. Right. It it really doesn't cost you give anything to give an employee extra PTO. It really doesn't. No. Well, and that's a whole other layer to this is like, well, is the why is that a coveted prize? Like, are you (laughs) not providing uh, enough PTO that is even fair? Because I've definitely seen uh, nonprofit sector employers that are in that bottom 10 percent of time off given and you know what it doesn't cost you anything just give the people the time off and do i get pto without you bothering me during the day like what are what's the ramifications of this pto can i take it whenever i choose does it have to be in conjunction with other pto what if i want to take it off the day before the gala like there's a whole lot of that and and then if you notice they mentioned other prizes staff members win prizes the winner gets an extra day of pto um, how are those prizes calculated in their, you're, you're the attorney, you know this better than I do. Um, how are they calculated in their compensation? Are they yeah. of value? Well, that's that, not super yeah. clear. It's like, this seems like they're going out to their network of community members and soliciting donations. So right. then it's like, even more so, wait, are we actually running a follow of an AFP standard accidentally? How, tell me what you mean by that. Well, uh, offering like compensation in exchange for your fundraising efforts. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, f- okay. Oh, wow. I hadn't even thought. <laughs> now oh, I blew wow. Clay's mind. Oh my God. Are the prizes based upon, well, mm, boy, that's a whole thing to pick apart because what are the prizes? What's the value of it? Are they tracked in an employee's compensation? Um, as compensation if they win a prize and therefore could that be considered a bonus for fundraising wow okay ethically and equity this needs to end sorry (laughs) sorry to be that blunt but you you have to look at it through that lens though ethically and and equitably right is this right if a staff member wants to run a peer-to-peer campaign for something like a giving tuesday or a giving day or something like that by all means encourage it allow it support it um but there's so much to avoid that this just this just concerns me on so many levels. The bigger question is why do we need this fundraising? Right. Right. Where why is this is this in any way significant to our budget for the Correct. year? Correct. 
If this is meant to be a staff engagement thing, let's think of better. Let's think of a better oh, way. It's a let's, fail. Let's, if this is a if this is a, supposed to be a morale booster yeah. or a team builder, let's put you all in a death match in the ring and have you fight to the death for one day of PTO. Whoever can bring in the most donations, that's going to really boost your morale as a team. <laughs> 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 right. You are you are my favorite podcast. You're my favorite podcaster, um, et cetera. And I say all of that to say I was on another podcast. <laughs> um, but cheater, the, cheater. Right. Yeah. Um, the the, where, oh the my question God. came up. Um, they did a whole party at a board member's house. They invited all the staff. And they ran a fundraiser along with it. So, and they invited prospective donors. And the whole thing was the chair of the board agreed to match donations up to $10,000 at the end of the party. They had met that. And he said, if we raise another 10, um, I get to throw the executive director in the pole fully clothed. And everybody thought this was clever and funny and hilarious and blah, blah, blah. And my reaction was, why did the board chair feel it necessary to embarrass the executive director in front of the community? How is that? What did that say to the rest of the staff and the team? Like there was so much ask, and everybody thought it was hilarious. And I'm sitting there going, no, there's a problem here. And this is the same thing here. I see a problem here. I'm willing to bet that those people that quote unquote win every year are the ones that are seen as the, you know, the popular club, the ones that have been there the longest, the ones like there's just a whole misbalance of stuff here, which could open the door handled well to have a really open, honest discussion with leadership about what the issues are. And then an open, honest discussion with the staff about why we're going to end this. And I guarantee you there will be people who will be relieved and grateful, but come up with something to recognize the staff in a different way. Right. And I, one of the most valuable classes when I did my master's in nonprofit management, one of the best classes I ever took was organizational organizational culture and development yep that is one of the least considered aspects when i'm working with nonprofits nobody's ever being like well i wonder how this affects our organizational culture it's like your culture is getting created without you even trying and so you need to be aware that that is a thing that you're doing and this, you know, of course, this goes into the equity and inclusion and racial justice and all of that, but just into having like a bro weird, hierarchical bro yep. culture where people throw you in the pool as a laugh for 10 grand. Like, is that the culture you want to be creating? People need to stop and think about these things as the like little idea generator is going, there should be another lens <laughs> that we put against the ideas before we go implement them. In a situation like a work environment, the in-group has to consider the feelings of the out-group. And the in-group is always there. And it's very easy to say, right, we're, we're senior leadership. We know who our best employees are because they're always engaged. They're always doing things. And we tend to listen to them and not to the ones who are on the outside. Right. Not to the ones who aren't engaged. Same thing in the classroom. We never learned this in education. Right. I teach strategic planning in the graduate school at University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And my students schooled me this semester on values, organizational values that are culture. And therefore, our strategic planning comes out of our organizational values. The question is, how do we live those values? Are they just a statement that we make or do they really guide? Because if we're going to publish, if we're going to publish a support statement for Black Lives Matter, if we're going to, if we're going to publish and many nonprofits do, right? Our equitable statement, do we live it every day? Because we can't, we can't publish out there. These are our values and we value all people and we value all, and then create something like this that creates a separation within the organization. Culture has to come from leadership and it has to come out of those values. We've really got to believe them and, and live them or we're just giving lip service to it. Well, and I think it's, it's hard to make that switch. It's almost like everybody at the organization needs to carry a little three by five index card with the, our, this is what we've said our values are. And I'm going to have this in my pocket. And every time I'm about to implement uh-huh. s- some new thing, I'm going to pull this index card out of my pocket and actually do a little check here. Like, is this in alignment with our values? Like, I really think it almost has to get that basic rudimentary 
because we just forget and we just do what we do. (laughs) I worked with one organization that published their core values, made them adhere to the brand guidelines and bought picture frames that match that fit the office decor so that everybody had their core values in the same frame visible on their desk. They worked so hard at presenting their core values that they forgot to live their core values. Oh, I was so excited for that story, Clay. I was like, I know, I'm sorry. This is great. That's so great. And right. then they f- dropped the ball. And they would literally have demeaning, degrading conversations with people at their desks in front of this value that said, you know, we don't demean and degrade people. Like it was literally happening. Oh, man. So, so that's the index I mean about- card doesn't work. <laughs> well, it might. It, it would if you empower everybody to hold everybody accountable. Right. Yeah. So that the lowest paid employee or the lowest ranked hierarchically can look at the executive director and say in confidence and comfort without fear of repercussions. Hey, in this moment, you're not living the values that you profess. This is what I'm feeling. And this is what I'm seeing right now. And let that be allowed and heard. Right. Yeah. I champion this this newer staff member coming forward on this. I was just going to say, to circle back to the question, bravo. (laughs) Right. And I champion this person who heard it and listened to it. Yeah. I love that they're wrestling with it. They're going, this happened. And A, bravo that this person could come to you. It's not like it's a toxic goo workplace because this person actually felt empowered to come say something to you. And you are wrestling with it, which is all we can really ask. Yeah. And if this organization really wants to live up to this and really wants to do something, if I were their consultant, if I were their organizational leadership consultant, I would say, good, bring everybody, including the board, into an open discussion and really talk about this and really listen to what people are saying. Yeah. And not... Calling this person out and being like, well, so-and-so said that this was a problem for them and... Right. (laughs) And also, don't come back and go, we we understand that this has created some bad feelings, so we are going to end this program and we'll let you know what the next one will be. No. This is an opportunity for cultural and organizational growth. Bring everybody to get together, have it facilitated, open up the discussion. I guarantee, I guarantee you there are other issues here that aren't being spoken about that are part of this. Um, it's a huge opportunity for growth, for learning, for some really positive development, right? Yeah. Flip the script on it and make it a positive evolutionary process, not a, an admonition one. Yeah. Right. So for the takeaways here, you know, well, I think one is sort of this tussle between how to deal with employee giving. Right. So employee giving is great, but not if we make it a shame based, competitive, demoralizing experience. Agreed. So make it available, but, you know, stay classy. And then. Well, I think another one is that we need to kind of be careful what our fundraising, especially internally, says about our organizational culture for our staff. Yeah. And then we need to really stay mindful and conscious of filtering our good ideas for not only mm-hmm. legal and ethical filtering, but also org culture. And what are we trying to accomplish here? And are we living up to our values? Or do we even have any values? (laughs) Well, yeah. Do we, do we have them and do we, do we, do we value them? Do we really live them? Do we value our values? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there's, you know, there's, there's your, your, what you say your values are. And then there are, there, there's reality. Right. Exactly. So we want to make those things match, you know, yep. in a in a positive way. One hundred percent. Can I just plug a real quick resource um, yes. on this? We like resources, especially if they're useful and helpful in solving these problems, because these are messy and difficult. <laughs> and I can get you the the link to it. Our friend from Twitter, Ephraim Gopin, published an ebook about a year or two ago yep. on employee giving. I, I um, did a blurb for that. He interviewed me for that. Oh, fabulous. I'm in there. <laughs> it, it's a, it, it is, to the best of my knowledge, one of the only real resources on it in the sector. And it's really quite well done. Would encourage anybody to download it, yeah. read it, absorb it, because it's just a phenomenally good um, 
uh, resource for it. I've got the link for you. I can share it. Yeah, sure. we'll throw that in the show notes. If I'm Great. open, I think it's... 1832communications.com. There you go. Look at yeah. you. And if I mispronounced his name, I apologize. I always struggle with that one. I always thought it was Ephraim, but it's Ephraim. Oh, oh, good. There you go. Right. All right. So, if you want to find Ephraim, he's on Twitter. Yep. Clay is also on Twitter. T. Clay Buck. <laughs> and you can find Clay at his website, tcbfundraising.com. There you go. Clay, thanks so much for being here. Oh, thank you. This was great. Folks, if you enjoyed this episode, do me a huge favor. Share it with a friend. Rate, review, subscribe on your podcast app. It really does help me out. If you have a question or a story to share, I'd love to hear from you. Send me a note online or leave me a voice memo by calling 612-208-9120. Thanks for listening. All right, folks, that's our show. Be sure to follow me on Instagram or Twitter at Jess Birkin. We want to hear from you. Send us a message at our website, charitytherapy.show. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at birkinlaw.com slash sign up. Charity Therapy is a production of Birkin Law Office, PLLC. Our theme song is by Whalehawk. And remember, folks, this podcast is produced for your entertainment and is not a substitute for actual legal advice.